Hi all, I have another fascinating game to show you between Leela and Stockfish. Leela was playing white in this game, 5 minutes with a 2 second increment. And the opening, after d4, knight f6, knight f3, e6, we have bishop g5. This is the torre attack. So the bishop pins that knight. c5, c3, so it has some elements common with the London system triangle of boredom here. This triangle, very solid in the center indeed d5 knight bd2 knight bd7 bishop d3 now a curious move i thought from stockfish c4 in general this move is to be avoided uh, as it releases the central tension this means sometimes for example e4 e5 might be more effective and also the pawn chain is slightly looser with that pawn committed there if white can undermine d5 then that will weaken c4 later we see b5 both sides castle now knight e5 a really interesting decision to have double pawns in the center however there are some perks to doing this commitment of pawns here if for example e4 sometimes black can grab the d5 square or be comfortable on the diagonal and here for example h6 d takes e4 bishop b7 gives black a comfortable bishop and the concession of releasing the tension is kind of balanced by the diagonal pressure and the d5 square for black this could be quite comfortable and nice for black so e4 is not really that effective in this particular position so 95 really interesting decision we have these double pawns Bishop takes e7, queen takes f4. And you might think, well, isn't black doing really, really well here after b4? Because isn't white structure being compromised? Very, very interesting positional considerations going on here. Knight f3, bc3, bc3, f6. So also trying to, well, volunteering to undouble white's pawns in the center to gain access quite often. Uh, to more exploitable weaknesses if black tried queen a3 here in fact white can play bishop takes h7 greek gift sacrifice works okay in this position so at least yeah this is really dangerous with queen h7 and you see that this back row it hasn't developed so black can't play rook h8 here and white will get the material back with strong interest massive attacking position there with the big knight on e5 uh, so f6 e takes knight takes so this kind of safeguards the whole h7 issue against the greek gift however look at the dark squares in black's camp knight e5 and also this d4 square looks nice in fact that is used here queen a3 queen d4 rook b8 so a fascinating position rook f2 we have knight d7 and now h4 yes there's a majority of pawns over here if a form pawn can be installed that would be really dangerous knight takes queen takes rook b6 and now this is really interesting this pawn chain i mentioned if d5 could be undermined then c4 will be weaker and in fact here white hits it with e4 queen d6 queen d4 rook a6 if rook takes f4 by the way then there's e5 this is winning for white after rook takes e takes say rook takes h4 well the rook was attacked then we double rooks and that is a loose piece to be exploited in this position to rook f8 uh, and it's also the threatening mate as well so black would end up losing a piece in this variation so uh, black has to tread carefully rook a6 we have a4 bishop d7 h5 bishop e8 here if h6 you might think to block the course of that h pawn then a5 is very nice for example this position with f5 breaking down trying to break down black's pawn chain and f6 actually installs a very dangerous form pawn so even if a5 drops over there this is extremely dangerous pressure against black's king side 
uh, evolving, for example, like this is devastating. Black would be losing the queen. King f7, rook e7 check, drag uh, the king away, an attraction tactic to win the queen there. Now let's put that on the board. So that attraction tactic, technically. Okay, so uh, bishop e8 was played, not h6. e5, queen b6. And now g4. Yeah, this, this looks as though it's really going for the classic f5 break against this pawn chain to undermine at that exploitable point, e6. Queen takes. This helps, of course, white's pawn structure here in the center. Interestingly, also, there's a major opportunity that this move has created uh, by removing the c3 pawn. The king in the end game might want to go up to c3 and then later into black's position, you know, via c3, onto this diagonal you know maybe even this this kind of route uh so yeah that that'll be very very exciting for the king to use c3 later rook b6 a4 i mean a5 there's no rook b2 here because of the tactic bishop takes h7 check hitting the rook on b2 so a5 we have rook b4 rook a3 Bishop f7, and now the king does start going towards that c3 square. So a nice king walk in the end game. It looks like a great square to use. a6. So there's a couple of things going on, at least in this position. The potential for the king walking into black's position, if black's not careful, on the dark squares, but also this f5 break. Rook a1, rook 8, b7, rook ff1, which should be 8, king 8. A rook h1, rook b5. Now f5 here, bishop d7, h6, rook b2, rook a3. This is a defensive prophylaxis move because sometimes this could be dangerous, this kind of tactic. As an example, uh, just to give a feel of the position tactically, h takes, e takes. If here, f takes, um this would be uh even though it's winning the bishop that that g pawn could be dangerous coming down the board and this is just about equal there's a very tactical sequence there if we have a look at this again this kind of stuff instead of rook a f1 if g takes just to show the tactic of b3 here then bishop takes is possible because if bishop takes then this other rook comes and it's check mate so it looks as though this is a strong prophylaxis move for b3 possibilities. Bishop e8. On e takes, uh, this is just really undesirable. G takes. These pass pawns connected, mobile, it's to be avoided in general. Bishop e8. H takes. Black's pawns are getting fragmented. Uh, a nice target h pawn now. Rook h2. And it looks as though here... Uh, you might be thinking, you know, f6 and, and rook takes h7, by the way. Uh, there's always rook takes c2 there. That's why that's not possible. I'll show you that in a moment as well, though. King d2. So here, rook h3. And the rook took on a3. If uh, rook b7, uh, king c1 is strong here with the idea of f6 and taking on h7. Not immediately... Uh, f6 just to put that on the board from earlier this there's just rook takes c2 and then king takes h7 so white has to do everything of course with tactical precision uh, so now black took on a3 rather than suffer this king c1 f6 idea yeah king c1 with with f6 is just if we just look at this position again it's very very difficult things are uh, coming together with the h pawn now not just this f5 break uh, so black actually it doesn't seem as though black has much to do here if bishop g8 as an alternative f6 check it's interesting here how black can get in trouble on the king's side with g6 check and this rook switching over so another perk of that rook a3 switching over and just crashing through like this for example Look at that pins bishop on g8. 
So yeah, there are some really crushing scenarios. So it did seem as though Black had to put up with an exchange of rooks, which basically weakens Black's control of squares now in this endgame. It's only the rook keeping the white king at bay to enter into those dark squares in this endgame. And in fact, the rook is evicted from b5 here tactically, bishop a4. If rook takes a5, then king b4 actually traps that rook there. So the rook's kicked away. Now, back on this side of the board for a bit to target h7. So here king g8 was played. Uh, if rook b5, f6 is strong, for example, taking on h7, coming back, check. This is just a nightmare, winning that bishop. So yeah, it looks as though this is very desperate. This is becoming a very desperate scenario. And in fact, white Lila is not tempted to play f6 or uh, f takes e6, but rather, curiously, to install the rook on f6. Yeah, where it's exerting a huge amount of pressure now for f takes. Uh, and then maybe to win a6 as well later. Rook e8. And now g5. Bishop g8. Yeah, black seems to be collapsing here structurally. There's an intense pressure on this pawn chain. It's pretty vivid. So bishop g8 was played. If e takes, bishop takes as an example. White is threatening things like bishop takes h7 here. So this would be a big advantage. So we have g5, bishop g8. And now... Uh, the king could actually have gone into b4 to c5, it seems. Uh, king d2 was played. It does seem at this position, at move 54, this is actually possible. Even if the bishop's given up, this is just absolutely winning, this scenario. Uh, yeah, white would be absolutely winning that endgame. But king d2, e takes. If rook e7 instead then bishop d1, bishop g4 really hits e6 hard. Uh, for example, like this. Uh, and that rook has entered the position the king's about to enter as well. The position is just hopeless for black there. So e takes f. Yeah, black's getting dismantled uh, structurally, basically. Bishop takes with huge pressure for the white pieces now. So yes, black's Rook has been condemned to preserving a6. You'll note that, yeah, the isolation of pawns is extremely evident here, and the pawn chain is about to be torn to shreds, the d5, c4 pawn chain. So rook b6, now that built a bridge for the king to now come in to that, to the dark squares potentially. Bishop takes h7. Yeah, you might wonder, well, why did black give away that pawn over there? It's to do with the king really coming in here. Uh, just to, as a, a replay here for a moment. So bishop e6. If king f7, the king comes in on the dark squares, hitting d5. That's okay, protects d5 for a moment. Rook b8. And then king d6. And then the thing is, the king's herding the pawn with e6. And that's just devastating. Yeah, it's absolutely devastating for black. So uh, bishop e6, yeah. So the, for the first um, time now for a while, uh, a pawn up officially. So the king steps back for a moment. The bishop steps back. The rook goes to that d6 square. And black looks to be giving up the pawn chain after this. Yeah, the whole pawn chain is being dismantled. It has been dismantled now. So there's connected past central pawns. I thought this game was absolutely fascinating. This is an absolutely winning transition to totally one rook and pawn ending now, of course. No hope for black at all in this rook and pawn ending. Three pawns down. It carries on to the, to the death in this tournament. Let's have a quick look. So... Leader could have got three queens, but instead, well, gives one of them up, under promotes a knight, <laughs> to the other one to give that knight up pretty soon. <laughs> yes, a bit funny. The knight's given up, but now, yeah, 
it's a much easier table base win now with queen queen and uh king check mate i found the game kind of fascinating because there's something i believe kind of nostalgic about computers when they play c4 in to release the tension in the london system structures traditionally that was thought of as a major mistake to release the tension i later you know discovered some interesting master game examples where sometimes it's fine if black gets the diagonal or the d5 square to do this kind of thing and even you know magnus colson has sometimes released the tension with advice to get as assets in the end game but in this particular game example leela managed to prove the slow dismantling of this pawn chain punishing this kind of nostalgic move c4 in quite a, an instructive manner i believe quite vivid instructive play there i i think you'll agree if you enjoyed this game as much as me then please click on the top left box which should appear shortly become a member of my site chessworld.net play against other youtubers you can also test yourself on the variations covered in this and other games from the improved menu the puzzle books option which also has a link to the annotated game comments questions donations see the description like share subscribe with the notification bell really appreciate it thanks very much